Well, this morning, if you would, turn to the book of Romans. We'll be in Romans chapter 2, picking up in verse 17. Kind of a quick recap here. Paul has declared, whether we want to admit it or not, that all men, even the most uh, pagan of the reprobates, or even the hardness or the hardest of the hypocrites, they know something of God's attributes. They know something of the presence of God and the reality of God, as God has placed that before them. Uh, and so it can never be said that they didn't know or didn't have a, an understanding or a sense of that. And every person, whether they be Jew or Gentile-like, has a witness even within their own heart and a conscience which they are able to discern that there is right and wrong and therefore recognize that there is a standard by which mankind is measured. Uh, we also recognize and really have a sense that written into us that there is a conduct worthy of death that is worthy of the wrath of God. And of course scripture makes it very clear that ultimately that is the destination of all mankind, that they will ultimately stand before God and be judged according to their conduct, their works upon this earth. Now we know that the Apostle Paul is building to a point here. <clears throat> and we know that that point, because we've read the rest of the story, uh, is about the gospel and the redeeming work of the gospel in the life of a people that when confronted with God's moral law find themselves wanting, find themselves helpless, find themselves in desperation because they recognize that God's standard is so high and so absolute and so perfect that we stand there in a condition of complete wretchedness, uh, in a condition worthy of wrath and even self-condemned by our own actions Thus that we, we need a Savior, we need someone who can stand in place of us before a holy God and take that punishment upon them. And of course, we know that that person is Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. However, we're not there yet. And so we have to travel down this road and recognize, and I believe this is just as w good for us, even as believers, as it is for an unbeliever to hear, to recognize. Because then we can truly appreciate what we have been saved from, uh, who we were, uh, even before that salvation. Uh, as well as it, uh, and as where Paul will ultimately even take this, it'll rad radically alter our relationships. When we recognize that before a holy God, we're all in the same condition. Uh, there's none of us that are superior. Now, it is important, and I, I believe this is Paul's point, is that before a person can be saved, they must first understand that they're lost. And uh, the Apostle Paul has been going there, and of course the, the assumption with the first crowd is, with these pagan moral retrobates, we know they're worthy of God's wrath, we know they deserve that, and that's where Paul starts, so the crowd is already pumped and psyched and, and cheering, especially for the moralist hypocrite, right? Uh, as they're saying, yeah, God really really ought to come down on them. By the way, the, the greater part of the audience here is Jews, and of course they despise the Gentiles, uh, and they really felt the Gentiles weren't worthy of God's attention anyways, and so when Paul made this summary remark about these moral ret reprobates, they are pr pretty well lumping the, the Gentiles into that condition. Uh, these these uh, self-righteous group uh, within that group. And so they're, they're ecstatic about what the Apostle Paul is saying. But then he goes and he turns the table on them. Uh, you're guilty just as they are. Uh, you're in the exact, you sit there in judgment and yet you are, you're guilty of the very same things. Which I'm sure had some shock value to it uh, in terms of the audience that is listening to this. And of course Paul is not even done with them. Uh, he's really uh, dealt with this, this hypocrisy. But now he's going he's gonna to push the thumb down. Uh, on these Jews, so to speak. Uh, and I would say that uh, the Apostle Paul is echoing something of the heart of Christ here, all of it's from the heart of Christ, but something in terms of a particular passion uh, that Christ had while he was uh, here on earth. And uh, that was how, how Christ viewed those who should know better. Those that had the revelation of God, i.e. the Jews, and then even as the Son of God, the the Messiah was standing in front of them. They could not recognize him, would not recognize him. Matter of fact, they even crucified him. There's a special element of wrath uh, for those that would come under judgment because they had a greater witness than any human, human creature prior to them. And yet, even as that witness stood in front of them, and remember how many times has someone challenged if God would only show himself, and there he is standing in the flesh, uh, and they condemn him to death and, and, and call him a heretic. But God, God has a special name for those individuals. And, and so I call this whitewashed tombs because this is where Paul is going to go today. He's going to go really into the heart of that crowd of those that think that because of their, 
their religion, because of their identification with God, uh, because of, again, all their credentials, if you will, uh, in terms of their religion and their religious practice, that somehow that they were exempt, uh, that somehow that they were uh, in a special category. Uh, and then the Apostle Paul is really going to uh, strip this away. And so when, when Jesus spoke of these, by the way, here's the warning that Christ gave. When it comes to the revelation of God and what people do and what they build the, their lives and their eternity upon, he makes this statement in Matthew 7, verses 26 and 27. He says, and everyone who hears these words of mine, everyone who hears the testimony of Jesus Christ, the word of God, and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. Okay, so he's given us a word picture, an imagery here. And what is that imagery? And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell and it great was the fall of it. And of course we know what it, what it looks like when a flood hits and it destroys things and, and the power of that. Uh, and there is no resistance to such a power. And, and Christ is saying, to those who hear my word and yet do not do them, the, this is what it looks like. And so in their mind, there's this picture being established, which is a very, uh, very Hebrew thing to do, because they want you to not just understand it, Greek way, right, knowledge, they want you to experience it when, in your comprehension. And so everyone can comprehend this. We've all seen the, the, the consequence of a flood. And that's the, that is the nature or, or the word picture that Jesus is using for those who reject the testimony of Jesus Christ. Those who uh, reject that. And Paul said, you know, there's this great crowd among humanity, Jew and Gentile alike, who have been given the revelation of God and they have chosen to suppress that knowledge. They have chosen to reject that knowledge. And Jesus is saying, you know what, all those that have been given this witness and they'll reject it, they are going to be judged. And this is what it looks like. And so great is the fall of it. But then there's also those, and this is, this is kind of like the ultimate... Uh, insult, or if you will, or offense to God. And I believe this is where, where Christ has a special burning uh, uh, attitude towards a certain group of people, and that is the scribes and the Pharisees, because these were to be the teachers of the law. Uh, if anyone was supposed to know the information, right, you would expect that. If I sit in a classroom and the teacher's teaching it to me, who should understand the material, right? The teacher should. Uh, and so these people were given a special place within their culture, within their, uh, within their national boundary, to be the expositors of the word, the ones who made clear uh, the message of the word of God to those that were the followers, those that were identified as the Israel, Israelites, so that they might know what it means or what it is to have a relationship with God and, and all that that entails. And so it wasn't simply, by the way, they, they took God's laws and they added some, uh, would you say 600 and some, right? Yeah, it's, it's a, just a myriad of other laws that were brought upon it and conditions. And of course, those things were all simply to serve them anyways. And so it became this legalistic system. So how does Christ react to them? And, and I, that's why I believe that he has a special heartburn, if you will, if I could even use that imagery. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. And he uses this term, hypocrites. Remember him, hypocrite? In other words, you're, you're, you're putting forth an image, but it's not the real image of who you are. Right? You're hypocrites. For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. Now, I don't know about the, the scribes and the Pharisees, but if somebody was to say that of me, it wouldn't be a flattering remark. Uh, and perhaps, you know, okay, what's, what is the point here? What, 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 do you, what do you mean? Because the Pharisees were very creative in putting on a face. Matter of fact, they would literally wear makeup when it was times of fasting. So that they would look ashen and gray and look, you know, some of, even though they were probably chubby men, but nonetheless, to, to take on an image of one who is, you know, just, a, well, I've been fasting for so long, right? And so people would look at them and be impressed. Oh, just look at how, how spiritual they are and how godly they are. And yet Christ is saying, you know, what, what is on the inside is dead. It's, it's, matter of fact, it's beyond decay because all that's left is the bones. All that's left is 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 the, the, the decays. And so for those who are to be identified really as spiritual leaders within a culture, who are to be the, the godly, godly people of a culture, uh, what, Christ is looking at them and saying, you know what, here I stand and you reject my witness. And like that house built upon a sand, it's all going to be washed away. It's all going to be brought into judgment. And you sit here as, as the leaders of, of this nation and you're putting on a face, but the truth of the matter is you're nothing but decay. You're nothing but... but this, this rotting decay behind. And so there's this, this 
And I would say even beyond an admonishment, it is a rebuke of those who stand uh, in the position of authority within this nation. Now, we know that uh, hypocrisy uh, is by itself self-condemning because hypocrisy, remember, we said in judgment of others, and so we presume that there is a standard of truth by which all people should be measured, and the problem is that I'm the only one that knows it. And so, therefore, it's my responsibility to tell the rest of you, okay, well, that's not the truth, but that is what we assume. And in doing so, what do we do? We, we heap self-condemnation upon ourselves, but because we're, we're claiming that there is an objective moral truth. So we recognize the reality of it, though we choose not to live by it. And so we recognize, again, hypocrisy and its self-condemning uh, activity. And so in our study of Romans thus far, Paul has shown that along with the moral rep reprobate, uh, both the moral Jew and the moral Gentile will be brought before God's great tribunal in the end and have no basis for, uh, for any sense of well-being and security in the face of God's judgment. And then if anything, they'll condemn themselves as they stand before God in that day of judgment. And so when we get to where today's text is, Paul focuses exclusively on the Jews. I call these the religionist. Right? These are the ones that are very religious people. Anybody ever say that about you? I always despise that term. <laughs> You're very religious. Okay, a lot of followers of Buddha are very religious, and Hinduism are very religious. Uh, I would like to think that there's something a little different there. But th these are religionists by, by, by belief, by practice. In other words, they have a religion uh, that they follow. And I like to say, I don't have a religion, I have a relationship. Uh, and that is, there's a radical difference in that. Uh, they were the covenant people of God. And so therefore, they had a religion. Uh, and they were, were resting their, uh, their, their very souls upon that. Uh, we would say of the Jews, uh, this group of religionists that Paul's addressing, uh, they had far greater light uh, and far greater blessings than the Gentiles. Uh, but as the Apostle points out now, uh, the, this greater privilege uh, is going to make them more accountable to God. And so they're going to have that special place of, of, uh, of God's eye and focus upon them. Uh, certainly not going to have less accounting, by, by the way, which is what they believed. And notice how man is always 180 out there, the complete opposite direction of God. Right? We're the chosen people of God, therefore we're somehow exempt. We're not subject to God's wrath. And the truth of the matter is, no, you have more revelation of God. God has revealed himself more fully to you. So therefore you are more accountable to God. And on the day of wrath, you're going to suffer a greater uh, uh, judgment as a result. And so mankind, again, everywhere he goes, it's always in the opposite direction. And so before the Apostle Paul gets us to the point where he's going to explain the way of salvation, how, does one save, how is one saved uh, through faith in Christ, uh, and, and from all of this, uh, we're going to look at really break this down into three categories uh, that the Jews are wearing. And I use this image of a cloak, right? Uh, I've got my special jacket on. I'm a smart, part of a special club. Uh, they're going to look at their heritage as Jews, right? So we're a Jew. Uh, remember, I think I told you the little, the little belief that there was. You know, Abraham stood at the gates of hell, right? And any Jew that would come, you know, they'd be exempt. No, you're not going to hell. You know, you're God's chosen people. Right? And we know that's not true, but that's, that was their belief, and that's how far it had gone. So they had a heritage of Jews. They also had a knowledge of the scriptures, and we'll spend the bulk of the time there. And, of course, next week we'll look at them really even at the instruments of ceremony and how they would hide behind those things, circumcised, uncircumcised, uh, an identification uh, with uh, the relationship with the Lord. So let's begin with uh, this, this cloak of heritage out of Romans chapter 2, uh, the beginning of verse 17. It says, but if you call yourself a Jew... Now, the chosen people of God, they took uh, great pride in this name. And, of course, sometimes it's used as in, in a derogatory way by the Gentile culture, but they would take pride in it. Uh, the, the, the Jew really is derived from Judah, one of the tribes of Israel. And, of course, ultimately when the tribes uh, divided as a nation, uh, the, the southern tribe was the tribe of Judah, kind of uh, became the name synonymous with them. And then ultimately, even after captivity, it became a, a name applied to all of them. Uh, so as a people, they're called Jews. And even to this day, we still uh, use that term to, to reference them. Uh, and so the name represented both their racial and religious heritage. And in their, their own minds, it denoted their distinctiveness from all other peoples of the world. And of course, despite all the, the bondage and oppression uh, they had suffered at the hands of the Gentiles, uh, they still recognized and uh, wore the name of Jew as somehow a, a, a name or a name of, uh, it's a badge of honor. But the, and of course, and distinguish them from anyone else. And we would say even today, uh, we, might, we might we use names like that. You know, well, I'm A, and you fill in the blank, and then somehow that brings some sort of prestige or, or a special relation to it, ship to it. And so uh, the Apostle Paul, uh, right off the, the, the bat, is saying, you know what, you call yourself a Jew, that's not going to save you. 
All right, that's, that's not what, what is going to be uh, saving you. And then he goes right to this knowledge they have of God. Uh, and I break this down into three components here. Uh, what, what they, they have this knowledge of God. And, uh, and the Apostle Paul breaks it down. He says, and you rely on the law and you boast in God. Uh, you know his will and you approve what is excellent, right? You, there's kind of this, you know, you, so somehow embracing uh, this knowledge. And these are things that they have learned. And so this second false religious security, the first being they're Jews, their second being this knowledge, uh, he, this, this cloak of knowledge of God's law, and he, he, he really brings it into subjection. You have this divine revelation, uh, and it has four aspects of it that are going to bring you into judgment. Number one, you've learned it. In other words, if all people should know and understand the will of God, and the plan of God, and really the foretelling of God, the coming of the Messiah, it should have been the Jews. Uh, not only did they, uh, have they learned the law, they were taught the law, and they're teachers of the law, and then ultimately what they did in light of that. And of course, there's where uh, the, the burning rub comes, because here they are, a people who are quite well informed, uh, even so much so that they're teachers of others, uh, and then what are they doing with that knowledge? And so taken by itself, uh, this statement by Paul might be seen uh, really to have been a condemnation when you begin to look at this. And, and he's going to make that very clear. It was a, a strong indictment because the Jews did not live up to the law. And they knew it so well and they praised it so highly. Uh, matter of fact, they had taken God's instruction literally. They're adorning themselves with it, putting it on their head and upon their clothing. And most Jews of that day were proud and self-righteous about their heritage and had come to rely upon uh, their knowledge of the law and they're boasting in God as a means of satisfying the Lord. Uh, they love to recite uh, this passage in Psalm 147, 19 through 20. Now, if you take this out of context and you run with this, you've got yourself a badge of honor, right? He declares his word to Jacob, he being God, his statutes and rules to Israel. Now, notice verse 20. He has not dealt thus with any other nation. They do not know his rules. Praise the Lord. Right? And so what do we do with that? We, we, we look at the rest of the world and say, well, na 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 right? Look what we've got. You don't. And so we are of a special club, of a special category. And the Apostle Paul is going to take that and use it as an indictment against them. Yeah, you've got the law. And what have you done with it? What are you doing with it in terms of your, your witness uh, uh, to the world? And so the Old Testament makes its purpose quite clear. And, of course, they've got what we would look at as the Old Testament today. This is the revelation that they have. Uh, and we would look at this and say, well, it was really impossible, and catch this, for anyone to keep all of God's laws perfectly. We look at that sometimes, and it kind of creaks open a little door of compromise. And some of the, the rabbis began teaching that merely learning the facts of the law was sufficient to please God. So watch this road as we go on it, right? Well, just learn it, right? Just learn it, and God will be satisfied, right? And, of course, weakening the purpose of the law still further, some taught that the mere possession of it in the form of written scrolls was sufficient. All right, so you got your Bible, folks. You're okay with God, right? You're okay with that. Well, that's where they were going. And then still others taught that the Jews were safe from God's judgment simply because they, as a people, they were specially chosen recipients and custodians of God's law. So really, it's just by association. Well, I know a Jew, right? Well, I am a Jew. So therefore, I'm among. And so this kind of, again, what do we do with the law? What do we do with what it declares? What about the responsibility we have to it? And so the Old Testament, again, makes its purpose quite clear uh, and repeatedly warns against Jews placing their trust in outward ceremonies and objects, even though such as the priestly sacrifices in the temple, which God has ordained. Uh, matter of fact, this passage out of Jeremiah 7, 3 through 7, there used to be this response in, in terms of calamity should become uh, our direction, right? Well, we've got the temple, and they would make this expression. Uh, verse 4 of Jeremiah chapter 7, right? Do not trust in those deceptive words. In other words, God is, is rebuking them because they're making this, they're, they're relying upon and state, making this statement. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Let's say it three times because then, you know, the world will stand in awe of us and they will step back uh, from uh, the calamity that's about to behold us. And of course, he goes on to rebuke them. If you truly execute justice to one another, if you, if you truly follow the law, there would be safety. There would be blessing. But rather what you're doing is you're standing behind the, the presence of the temple and say, well, we've got the temple, so therefore we're in a special a category. And so what are they doing? They're, they're re relying on some sort of safety uh, in the presence of, of the temple. Well, going on with what they have learned, uh, and of course the point being, spiritual safety and security was not in the temple, but in God himself and faithful obedience 
uh, to the, his divine truth and the righteousness that is revealed to them uh, through the law. And so when these, these Jews would boast in God, it was really a means of boasting in themselves and the unique privileges and blessings they thought that were theirs rather than by grace. And so it became really of untaught to the Gentile world uh, and against them. And so self-righteous, presumptuous Jews were satisfied simply to know his will without ever obeying it. Again, name association. And then go down that road of compromise. They're also willing to approve what is excellent. And of course, this has the idea of to prove the value of something. So in other words, they, would, they could sit around in agreement on what the law declares. And yes, that is good, that is right. Uh, and they could even impose it upon the people. Uh, that They could give instruction uh, from the law. And of course, this had the idea of, of literally sitting down the, the young minds and instructing them. And of course, probably even had in mind instructing the Gentile world because they would have no understanding of it. And so here you are, you, you approve what is right, you, you can instruct in what is right, uh, but again, it makes no difference. And so these Jews considered wisdom to consist of... By the way, there's, there is a, there's something significant in what is taking place within the Jewish mind. Because if you were to talk to a Jew about knowing something, they would say you know it when you act in accordance with that knowledge. In other words, that knowledge causes you to behave differently. As if, like we talk about, to understand something, to know something, you, you, you have to experience it. That's why the imagery... Where the, the Greek mind would say, you know what, just simply having the knowledge. Can you pass the test? Can you get, can you get five out of ten on a true false? You know, that's, that's the Western Greek mind, and that's where we are. You know, that's, that's our understanding comprehension of knowledge. So what the Jews had literally done is begun to adopt the Greek mind. Begin to accept that, oh, we have a knowledge of the law. We can teach the law. Yeah, we can agree with the law. Uh, and so therefore, we are, we are, we're safe. We're still God's people, and are therefore accepted by God. And so they, they knew much, but they obeyed little in that context. And he goes on, what, what, speaking of what they taught, so not only do they have the law uh, in terms of their understanding, uh, what they have learned, uh, and then they go on and they teach others. The Jews not only felt secure in what they knew, but also in what they taught. And, of course, they considered themselves to be religiously wise. They naturally thought themselves to be the most competent teachers of the spiritually unwise Gentiles who did not have the benefit of that knowledge. And, but again, there was disobedience, and this disqualified her as an example. Jesus made a statement uh, when, when he was on earth uh, to the Jews. And I'll catch this statement. Because they're, they were to be a witness to the Gentile world. Uh, they were to be an example to them. And as a result, the, the Gentiles should then come to know and understand who God is and become into that, that fellowship with him. But what are they doing? This is a rebuke in Matthew 23, 15. It says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Again, there, there's that word, hypocrites. For you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. That is to make a single convert to Judaism. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Now that's conversion, folks. Here they are in their religious system, in their re religious self-righteousness, and they're going out, what are they doing? They're making converts of hell. And all they're doing is convincing people of, of their, their foolish thinking. And as a result, uh, they're, they're, they're simply reinforcing the damnation that is already upon uh, that soul, rather than bringing them into a saving relationship with the Lord. And so instead of leading Gentiles to trust in the true God and become obedient to his will, these leaders engulf these converts in vast system of man-made legalistic traditions. You remember uh, Christ make that statement, take my yoke upon you? Right? Remember that? In the context of that statement, it has to do with the... Uh, the, the scribes and the Pharisees are there and all their imposed system of religion upon the people and the people are just crushed by it because they can't satisfy it they can't keep it and Jesus is saying you know what take my yoke upon you I have an alternative for you but wait aren't these God's teachers and yet they have created such a monster uh, that all that they're doing is creating converts of hell and sustaining converts of hell well going on with what they have taught in Romans uh, 2, verses 19 through 20, Paul mentions four specific areas in which many of the Jews consider themselves to be spiritually superior to their teachers. First, you are sure that uh, you yourself are a guide to the blind. All right? Yeah, I can see. I, we are, we're here to help, right? It's kind of like our government. I'm with the government, and I'm here to help. And, you, and your retort might be, well, maybe you ought to help yourself first. Right? Can, you, can you truly do that? There might be some challenges there. So the Jews, really, and the scribes and Pharisees in particular, considered themselves to be superior mentors of the community in spiritual and moral matters. And the truth of the matter is, uh, they were blind. 
Uh, but because of their arrogant pride and blatant hypocrisy, Jesus charged them with being blind guides. I'll give you Matthew 23, kind of the greater context of verse 24 through 28. Notice how he starts it off, you blind guides. Now, think about this practically, folks. You have an image here put in your mind. How effective is a blind guide going to be in terms of a journey? Well, okay, there's going to be some serious challenges. Or you hope he knows the path well because the, they're not going to help you. And he goes on to rebuke them. What are you, scribes and Pharisees? Again, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Again, a, a powerful image. That's like, let's go home and let's use our dinner plates and let's only wash the outside, folks. And let's make that a practice. And you're probably all, well, that's disgusting. That's the point. Right? And he's, he's given an image of, of their, 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 their religious system. He says, first clean the inside and the cup and the, and the plate. And goes on, he says, you are like whitewashed tombs. There's that statement, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead man's bones. There's the accusation, the claim against them. So you're, they're blind, blind guides. And then he goes on with the cloak of knowledge in terms of what they taught. And second, Paul notes that these Jews consider themselves to be the light to those who are in darkness, when in reality they are in darkness themselves. And the, by the way, there's a little sarcasm here in terms of, you know, you, you think this is who you are, but in truth this is what you are. And of course, actually, this was precisely the role that God intended them to be. And of course, they would look at the word, they would agree with the word and say, we are. We are the light to the world. He called his people to be spiritual light to the Gentiles. Isaiah 42, 6, uh, they are to be a light to the nations. And uh, they were to be the evangelist of their time. And also in Genesis 12, 3, it says, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so through the Jewish nation what there was to be blessing upon the rest. But likewise for us, Jesus declares that his disciples are to be the light of the world. And uh, he makes this statement in terms of uh, uh, who we are to be. He says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. And in the same way, here's your picture, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And so just, just like a, hill, a city on the hill, it's, you don't hide it. It's seen. It's seen by others. Uh, and so there, this light is to be seen, and uh, a light in the room. And this has always been God's intention for his people, and whether it be the na nation of the Jewish nation or whether it be the church uh, today. He gives them light not only for their own spiritual benefit, but also for the spiritual benefit of the rest of the world before whom they have witness. And so for the Jewish people who had the law, who were teachers of the law, who had been learned in the law, uh, they were to be doers of the law so that the rest of the world could see uh, God's great plan of redemption. Again, not, not fill, fulfilling that. Well, thirdly, the self-righteous Jew prided himself as being an instructor of the foolish, kind of really building on this, this imagery. Here they thought they were the one who was wise. The truth of the matter is they were the one who was f the fool. He thought of himself as a teacher of children. Again, looking down upon the rest of the world and thinking we've got the answer, we've got the solution. So very much a religious arrogance and a religious, religious hypocrisy. Well, through God's unique revelation of himself and of his will to Israel, the Jews had the law and the embodiment of the knowledge of truth. In other words, they had, they had everything that they needed. The sketch was there. Everything was laid out for them. And so the, they had some semblance of it, but the truth of the matter is they did not have what uh, in their life what God had envisioned for them. And uh, much like 2 Timothy 3.5 tells us, there, there was a form of godliness, although they, uh, they will have denied its power. In other words, there's no relationship. There's no true relationship with God. And so it's an, the idea here is one of counterfeit. You've got it. You've got some sort of semblance of it. You've got some sort of structure of it. But it's, it's failed in terms of what it was meant. And so the Jews, indeed, through the law... Uh, have the revelation of God's divine knowledge and truth, but their understanding, their teaching, exemplified of it, uh, really became so encrusted with this rabbinical tradition and compromise that God's true law was generally unknown and disregarded. And that's why when the Messiah stood in front of them, they didn't recognize him. They rejected him. And then we come to the point where I think is, uh, begins to unfold really the charge that is levied against them. And that is, what did they do with this? Here you've got the revelation of God. What do you do with it? What is, what is it that they did? It says, and then when you teach others, uh, do you not teach yourself? In other words, don't you learn from your own instruction? Don't you pay attention in your own classroom? Don't you understand what it is that you're articulating? 
He says, when you preach against stealing, uh, uh, do you steal? Matter of fact, there was, there was a reputation of Jews in that time, of being thieves. And it was very commonplace. Matter of fact, there's, it, there's a string running through there. Because uh, they're, they're levying these charges. Uh, you who say that to you, one must not commit adultery, do you not commit adultery? What did they do with the, 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 the law system? Remember the charge to Jesus, right? You know, in terms of adultery, Moses said that we could divorce them, right? And Jesus says, no, no, wait, let's go back to the beginning. In the beginning, God created them male and female, and, and they were to be married. And other than, other than uh, infidelity, uh, they are to remain married until death, uh, were they to depart. But they had come up with this way that they could, as long as the guy would issue a certificate of divorce, it was okay. And so if he found plan B that was a little better... You know, he would issue the certificate of order. Again, they're, they're practicing these things. They're stealing. They're, they're committing adultery. And then he goes on, you who abhor, abhor idols, uh, do you rob temples? And uh, literally what they would be doing is they would they recognize the value in these temple, uh, these, these temple idols, and so they would steal the temple idols, and then they would sell them. Very crafty way to make some money, right? And Yeah, but what are they doing? But they're giving value to even what they claim to abhor. So you're enabling even what you would claim to say these are despicable things. It'd be much like us going out and buying drugs, right, just to resell them. Well, that's, that's foolish. Why would we do such a thing? And yet they were. And so what they did was they, really to take that knowledge and they would say, this is what is true, and then they would do uh, in the direct opposite. So if you put it in theological terms, their preaching reflects uh, right doctrine. In other words, they're, they're preaching the truth, if you will, but their living does not reflect right practice. And so they're claiming the truth, they're, they're preaching the truth, they're teaching the truth, uh, and they're assuming a responsibility in the truth, but they're not living the truth. And uh, we would equate them much like a corrupt police official or a judge who, li who lives in direct contradiction to the laws that they've sworn to uphold and enforce. Uh, we would say they have a greater responsibility. If anybody should know the law, if anyone should truly know and understand it. And so this hypocritical Jew of Paul's day would often teach another person the truths of God's word, but would fail to teach them to himself, fail to learn them the principles themselves, and they would not obey those, those truths. And so Paul, again, really deals with these three aspects, their hypocrisy and stealing and the adultery and ultimately in the sacrilege of it, and so on what they did. And so they, they preach against stealing, and yet they steal. They preach against uh, uh, the adultery, and yet they're committing adultery. Uh, they say that they abhor idols, and yet what do they do is that they become a marketplace for idols. They steal the idols so that they can, they can sell them and make money. And again, bringing us down to what I think is, the, is the, the, the point of accusation here, and this is the cloak of hypocrisy. What is the great violation here? What is the great... I mean, okay, so they make a choice. They know the law, they're teachers of the law, and they choose not to obey the law. So who does it affect them? What is, what is, the issue, what is at issue here? So when you get down to uh, verse uh, 24, there's an indictment here. And it really makes clear... Really, the rhetorical question of verse 23 and on makes it rhetorical. Many uh, hypocritical Jews were blatantly breaking the divine law. They were, they were so proudly boasting in it. Matter of fact, they were staking their eternity on it. And yet they were bringing a dishonor to God. And every sin dishonors God. Again, it's contrary to his will and to, to who he is. And sin committed by those who claim God's name, they dishonor him the most. And so we call that hypocrisy. It is to claim one thing and yet to be something else, to put on a face and then be something else. What does he go on to say? Well, he quotes out of Isaiah 52.5, Paul strongly rebuked hypocritical Jews by declaring that the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, which is completely opposite what God had envisioned for his people. They were to be proclaimers of the truth. They were to be a witness to the truth. And rather what they were becoming was blas they're causing people to blaspheme the name of God. And, and by the way, do we get the severity of the charge? The principle applies even more strongly, of course, even to us, because they not only gave, have, we not only have greater spiritual light through the New Testament revelation, but we have greater spiritual resources to obey that light through the indwelling Holy Spirit. So we, we, can, we can find ourselves in that audience and say, okay, here's the people who should know better. As a matter of fact, they're teaching they're teaching it. They're instructing others in it. They're boasting in it. And, and they're, they're declaring a confidence in it. And yet, what are they doing? But they're causing the world to blaspheme the name of God because they're not living it. They're not demonstrating it in their day-to-day -day lives. And if anything, they're, they're, all they're doing is living like the world. And so when a believer falls into sin, his witness is ruined, and the name of his Lord is soiled before the world. 
And those who claim to be Christians but persistently live in sin give evidence that they carry the name of Christ in vain, that it is not what, it's, what they declare it to be. And because there's no difference between their standard of living and, and that of the world, the Lord's name is blasphemed. Why should I accept your message? Why should I believe in your God when you live like that? I can live like that without him. When those who go by God's name are openly sinful or are exposed as being privately sinful, God and his word are understandably ridiculed by the world. And by the way, we know that. Watch a believer fall, right? Watch a man of God uh, fall into sin. The world will be on that, as we said back east, like stink on a skunk, right? Because it, it's, it's a lightning rod. It's a recognition. It becomes a blasphe- an act of blaspheme of the world. The unbeliever has no reason to repent of his sin, has no reason to turn to God for salvation if he sees these professed believers committing the same sin. And by the way, folks, holiness is not simply a term defined in our dictionaries. For us, it's to be a way of life. Uh, Peter talked about this. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 and 16. Uh, through 16, says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the, p- the passions of your former ignorance. In other words, that life is gone for the believer. That is no longer our appetite. But as he, verse 15, who, who called you as holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. And so not only, not only know God's righteous standard, not only preach God's righteous standard, but live God's righteous standards. And why is that important? Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. You cannot claim to be of God and yet be in activity that of the world. That's hypocrisy, and that causes the world to blaspheme the very name of God. And so all Christians, of course, by the way, there's there's a practical sense to this. All Christians fail to perfectly live up to the standard the Bible teaches. In other words, we can look at our lives, and anyone honest before God would say, you know what, there's some areas that I'm struggling with, there's some areas that I'm challenged with. Uh, No Christian has ever perfectly uh, lived Christ-like. But that is our goal, that is our ambition, and that is our pursuit, to be just like Jesus Christ. However, Christians are to genuinely seek to live the Christian life and are to rely more and more on the Holy Spirit to convict, change, and empower them. That is to be our appetite. That is to be our pursuit. And so as the world observes us through, through, from day to day, what do they see? More and more of Christ every day in us. And so not are not, not we just the, the recipients of the law, nor are we just the, uh, the, the ones who are learned in the, in, the, in the law and the understanding of the law, but we are also living that. And so, yes, Christians are not perfect, and they're making, they make mistakes, and they, they fail to reach perfection in this life, and that is, that is recognized. And that's not the same thing as being a hypocrite. But there are those of us who claim to be of the faith in Christ, yet live lives, both in their thoughts and their actions, that are inconsistent with that claim. And these are the ones that demonstrate what I call a convenient theology. In other words, much like the Jews, and this is the ones that Paul is confronting, uh, we even today, there are those Christians who will have a convenient theology. In other words, I believe it as long as it works for me. But as soon as a circumstance, as soon as a relationship, as soon as some sort of activity of life or experience of life it d- doesn't meet my self-defined necessary requirements for that, then it's no longer convenient and therefore I will do it my way. And so they have this convenient th- theology. As long as it's convenient, they will live according to and affirm the tenets of Scripture. Matter of fact, usually you'll ask them to the face, do you believe in the Word of God? Yes, I do. I do. However, the moment that the relationship or the circumstance or the desires become difficult or inconvenient, they set aside the tenets of Scripture to serve their own ends, and the world is watching that. And the world recognizes that. This is hypocrisy, and hypocrisy can and often does result in blasphemy. Blasphemy and this is important for us to understand, is to speak with contempt about God or to be defiantly irreverent. And the the, the dictionary defines it this way. Blasphemy is the written or the oral reproach of God, his name, attributes, or religion. Literally, it's to misrepresent God. We have terms like slander and liable. When you say something that is not true about somebody, that's slanderous. When we write something that is not true about somebody, that is liable. And that is what blasphemy is doing. There is a misrepresentation of God, and therefore the world is saying or writing things that are not true about God. And so God is misrepresented. And so blasphemy is a slander and libel directed at God, and we can be the the agents of that, causing people to misrepresent his person, to discredit his reputation. And the fact is, every time we do or say something that gives others a false representation of the glory, holiness, authority, and character of God, we commit blasphemy and in turn may cause others to blaspheme. And so holiness, again, is not just an arbitrary word in the dictionary. For us, it's to be a pursuit, a lifestyle. And we cannot back away when it becomes difficult. When God says it, we, we live by it. 
When our theology is only convenient, ours is a confused and uncertain God. What kind of God does the world see? Well, it works for him here, but not here. How does that work? This falsely represents God in our life and to those who observe us. And every time we misrepresent our position as children of God, we are damaging his reputation. Matter of fact, remember, we are what? We are God's representation in this world. And so we wear are to adorn the glory. Not only do we look no different than the world when we, we, we get into this mindset, we cause others to stumble in their knowledge of God. And therefore, what do they do? They reject his offer of grace and forgiveness. And think about the Jews, if this is their mindset, why would the Gentiles want a relationship with that God? Right. Why would they? Yeah, you're adulterers, you're thieves, you're all these, these things of reputation. Likewise, when the church claims to be the bride of Christ and yet prostitutes itself to worldly acts, worldly appetites, and worldly reasoning, it blasphemes. So what do we become? We become the greatest instruments of blasphemy. Because we stand taking the name of God, dragging it through the mud, and giving the world a false understanding. Now, fortunately... God forgives blasphemy. It is a sin, but when we repent and we confess that to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us. And if you doubt that, you can go to Scripture and look at several examples. Remember Peter's attack upon even the Lord's ministry, right? Surely, Lord, this won't happen to you. What was he doing? Take, trying to take him off, off subject, trying to take him off uh, his obedience to the Father. Uh, what about the Apostle Paul? Matter of fact, he, he, he was demanding of people to blaspheme even before he was saved. What about Jesus' own brothers? They thought he was a nut. They thought he was insane. Again, misrepresenting who he was. But all repented, and all were forgiven. And so there is this opportunity, even for those that, that have found themselves the practitioners of this blasphemy. And so the confrontation and the invitation is for the Jews of Rome to repent of their blasphemous lives. And so Paul's really calling it as it is uh, to confront them, because the gospel is not the gospel unless the truth is spoken unless the truth is recognized, unless the law is allowed to be the teacher that it was meant to be, so that a people can see but before a holy God I'm found wanting and in need of a Savior. And so they could seek God's forgiveness through Christ. And the message is for us to recognize that we too, uh, we might be whitewashed tombs. And so we have to ask the hard question of ourselves. You know, am I, am I guilty of a convenient theology? You know, does God work for me in these circumstances, but in others I fall away to my own ambitions, my own appetites, my own agendas, my own purpose? Is our life simply a whitewashed tomb adorned on the outside beautifully and practice Christianity while on the inside we are dead man's bones self of, full of self-indulgent purposes? And of course our, our call to action is clearly stated in 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 14 and through, through 16 here. As he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. He uses that word all again. What does he leave out? No silos there. Why do we do it? Because he's holy. And as we become more Christ-like, that should be the reputation of who we are. Otherwise, we become a stumbling block. And Paul's confrontation with the Jewish people is, you know what, you are a stumbling block. You're a stumbling block to everything that you claim to hold sacred. And not only are you causing others to be in jeopardy, you're in jeopardy. And apart from Jesus Christ, and apart of recognition of what that law has been teaching you, you're going to die in your sins, and you're going to be found on the day of judgment to be wanting and to be short of God's holy standard. And therefore... Now, while you're alive, while there's time, his, his, and as he goes on here in chapter 3, there's the offer of salvation. There's the opportunity to repent. The recognition that before God we're all in the same condition. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But it is the gift of God. That is, that is ultimately where he's going to take us. The opportunity for us to be saved. But in the meantime, even as, us, as, as we live our lives as Christians, where do we find ourselves in that? Because Paul's really gone through the, the spectrum of, of human experience and expression here. You know, the moral retrobate, well, it's obvious who they are, right? Then you got the self-righteous moralist, right? Well, you pick them out of crowd. Yeah, but what about us religious folk? What about us that have got it all together? What about us that can stand up in the crowd and we can preach the word? We know the word. Matter of fact, we can tell those little children the word. And yet we're living lives that are dead man's bones on the inside. Are we whitewashed tombs? So it is a challenge to us as a church so that we might be all that God has called us to be. And by the way, that's our call today, much as it was for the Jewish nation uh, then. Let's call us in a, in a word of prayer. <clears throat> well, Father, again, we do thank you for your holy word and even its confrontation, Lord, even when it shows us, Lord, to be in a condition or a position by which we 
we again find ourselves before your holiness, Lord, seriously lacking in serious need. And Father, our prayer is, is that uh, we would see this, Lord, as a challenge to holiness, that we would see this as a call to holiness as the people of God who say we know and love you. That even as we see Paul's rebuke and really confrontation with uh, these, these self-righteous religious Jews, Lord, that we would not even stand in judgment of them, but Lord, we would stand in judgment of ourselves so that we needn't be judged by you. And Lord, we would examine our own heart before you and ask the very hard question, Lord, what about my life? What about the life that I am living? Am I truly in pursuit of Christ? Is, is every day, to the, am I becoming more like him? Or am I simply in a pursuit of my own ambitions, my own appetites, and my own purpose? Am I serving myself or am I serving the Savior? And through that, Lord, that I might truly be, that we might truly be the full witness, Lord, you have called us to be. And Lord, if there is one here who doesn't know you, that uh, Lord, they would also would see from your word their need of a Savior. And that they are like all the rest of us, apart from Christ, they are without hope. But with Christ, the gift of salvation is offered. And the opportunity for them to believe is made. And Father, our prayer is that today would be the day of salvation. And so, Lord, even as we continue in this time of worship, Lord, may we truly, with genuine hearts, Lord, love you and show that through obedient lives. And we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. We stand as we close with Be Thou My Vision.